So here's the new video version of my old website top 100 list. I actually ended up implementing significant numbers of changes to the original list made back in 2009. Mainly I've pushed more and more since then towards prioritising Master System exclusives and originals and weeding out the downgraded ports from more advanced systems. At least apart from the occasional oddity where the Master System version has its own exclusive features. My thinking is simply that while some of those games were certainly very impressive for the system, the existence of significantly better versions make them largely redundant and unnotable in the eyes of most people, so it's not really useful to include them. Anyway, with that out of the way, on to the list. So starting out the list we have Safari Hunt. This was the original packing for the Master System, and was essentially Sega's answer to the famous NES bundle of the time that contained Duck Hunt and the Light Gun. And I'm not afraid to say that this was the better light gun game too. Sega just put in a lot more content and effort into it overall, creating multiple different environments with the game taking place across lakes, jungles and forests, and including many more enemy types with differing behaviours too. These additions, along with the Master System's excellent light gun itself, which was a little more accurate and better designed than the more famous NES one, led to a more polished and varied game overall. So Alien Syndrome was a top-down shmup released in the arcades where the aim was to rescue a certain number of survivors and then head to the exit before the time ran out and a self-destruct triggered. It was clearly inspired by the movie Aliens. This Master System game however, whilst also named Alien Syndrome, is not really a port but is an original title in the series with largely different levels and enemies. It's a decent game with some excellent, suitably grotesque bosses to fight and smooth action but lamentably it lacks the two-player option seen in other versions, which was one of the stronger features of the original arcade game. It's somewhat disappointing overall, but it's an okay game all in all. One of the earlier Master System games, Kung Fu Kid actually holds up surprisingly well for its age. It's a simple though addictive experience reminiscent of the old arcade game Kung Fu Master, but with a few more elements to it. The boss fights here especially are quite memorable and fun to master. The whole game also controls extremely well and is fast and responsive, and it's actually the oldest game that I can remember that included a wall bounce move, which would end up becoming a staple of platformers later on. If anyone can think of an earlier game, mention it in the comments, I'd be interested to hear about it. Pac-Mania brought a whole new dimension of gameplay to the original classic, quite literally. On top of the general elements of the classic series, dot munching and turning the tables on the ghost with power pills, the updated isometric graphical style allows for a new ability, the ability to do a quick jump over the heads of the ghosts to evade them at the last moment, which actually changes the dynamics of the game a lot. Overall a pretty accurate port of a good game. This is a respectable port of Taito's arcade hack and slash platformer, and one of the key early platform games released on the Master System. Rastan has you fighting your way through a Conan inspired fantasy setting, killing monsters, swinging from ropes and bouncing back and forth from wall to wall, which uh, was actually a new move that was added just to this version exclusively. Overall it's quite playable, a good length and contains a decent amount of challenge too. I definitely feel that one area where the Master System managed to have a slight advantage over the NES during the early days was with these top down run and gun games, though this did rapidly wane as the generation went on. This advantage was mainly due to the appearance of two key releases during 1986, the excellent The Ninja, more on that later, and this, which were only really going up against the NES's belated port of Commando at the time. Rambo in itself is actually heavily inspired by Commando, but has some notable improvements. Most crucially the inclusion of an excellent two-player co-op feature which would go on to be a staple of the genre. There's also some welcome power-ups to collect here too. Rambo remains a playable game, but its slow pacing and lack of variety in the levels have dated it somewhat in comparison to the Ninja and later top down run and gun games. Here's a well made miniature golf game that's addictive and quite varied. Apart from the usual elements you'd expect from the genre, Putt and Putter also has a slight puzzle slant, with conveyors and switches included in some of the course designs, which helps to make the game more interesting. The graphics and audio do the job for what's required of them, and whilst the game is not going to be setting anyone's world on fire, it is a pleasant enough time waster. So this one is your general track and field style multi-event sports game, with events primarily requiring either fast button presses or precision timing. It's not the most original of games, but is a well made and very polished example of the genre with respectable graphics. Always fun in multiplayer. Cyborg Hunter is a good, solid, though a little bit too straightforward action adventure game from 1988. Basically the aim is to explore the stages in a non-linear fashion, searching for new power-ups to improve your character's abilities and to allow him to progress through the levels. 
The gameplay is smooth, there's some good boss fights and the new powers you gain along the way, such as the ability to hover, keep the game interesting. Here's a simple and addictive little early mask system game where you play as Mick the Vampire Hunter. The aim is to explore a set of non-linear mansions searching for secret passageways and vampires to destroy. You can punch and jump on the enemies to kill them or stab them if you've collected the item and I recommend you make sure you have said item if you want to live long. Light bulbs also freeze the enemies in their tracks and stop the vampires from mercilessly beating you into the ground. Ghost House is a simple game due not only to its age but the fact that it was released on a card instead of a cartridge. You see the original Mars system actually had two different formats for its games. The normal cartridges for general releases but also these little budget cards for smaller games to be sold at a lower price that couldn't hold as much information. Most of these cards were not much good truth be told but there was a handful of notable ones that represented good value for money and Ghost House was among them. World Class Leaderboard was pretty much the only word in serious golf games during the 1980s. It appeared on just about all of the consoles and home computers of the time and was always a safe bet wherever it was found with good controls and decent amounts of features and elements. The Master System game is no different. It's very well made and has some of the more impressive graphics out there among the ports. This is a reasonable no frills horizontal shmup made by Sega where you're in command of a submarine. You get a forward firing gun and an overhead missile for dealing with enemies on the surface, both of which can be powered up. The game scrolls both horizontally and vertically. The apparent simplicity of its graphics and power up system belights fun game plan levels and submarine attack definitely does grow on you the more you play it and the further you get. It is a bit on the easy side though, the difficulty does ramp up on later levels but with only 6 levels and unlimited continues most will make short work of it unless aiming for a 1cc. One for the shoot em up rookies perhaps. I've never been a fan of the popular 16-bit Tasmania game on the Mega Drive and have always felt it to be an overrated game. Thankfully however the SMS version is a completely different game, one which is in my opinion better designed. It's free from the plethora of pitfalls and leaps of faith that plagued the Mega Drive game whilst retaining many of the elements that made it 16-bit cousin popular with you spinning your way through the stages at real speed. And whilst only 8-bit I find the presentation here actually much more easier on the eyes and ears. A respectable game, if a little short. This is a completely original version of Aladdin that was created for the Master System and Game Gear. So as a quick aside, for anyone who doesn't know, the Game Gear was pretty much a handheld version of the Master System that shared much of its hardware, uh, though it did have a larger colour palette. So later on in the Master System's lifespan, games would often be designed for both systems simultaneously to save on costs. Aladdin was one of these games. Unlike the other versions, this Aladdin had a more puzzle oriented Prince of Persia style of gameplay that works very well. The graphics are excellent and have to stand as some of the best on the system, including parallax and some very nice cutscenes too, and the audio is good for the SMS as well. The biggest problem with the game unfortunately is that it's quite short and easy, which is the main reason why it's not placed that high on the list. Rampart is an underappreciated strategy game that has a strangely effective Tetris element to its gameplay. Half the game is action, with you firing at oncoming enemy ships with your cannons before they land, and the other half is focused around using the Tetris style rotating blocks to repair your base and take over more territory to build more cannons. It's a simple but fun concept and it actually would have placed higher but when compared to other versions this Master System release is only a decent port of the game. It's just not quite responsive enough truth be told. Back in the day this was one of the most feature rich American football games out there and in some ways was actually a bit of a benchmark at the time of release. The gameplay is fast and responsive and you really do get the feeling that Sega were trying to cram as much stuff in there as possible. The game did much to undo the damage done by Sega's disastrous initial set of sports games they'd released for the system, the erroneously named Great series of titles, though unfortunately it was probably too late to make a difference by this stage. Good games that are based on film licenses are generally few and far between, but Dracula fits this category easily. What we have here is a no frills, well designed platformer with a well judged difficulty curve and respectable level layouts. The art design and audio can be unfortunately a bit of a letdown at times, but the gameplay still manages to shine through. Avoid other versions of the game as the Master Systems is easily the best one out there and by no small margin either. Here's quite a unique game which plays somewhat like a mixture of scrolling shoot em ups and the old arcade game Missile Command. The levels alternate between moving offence levels where you fly your satellite through space shooting at the enemy ships and static defence levels where the aim is to frantically detonate incoming missiles before they hit your planet. 
The controls take some time to get used to, with you having to swap between moving your satellite or moving a cursor that you aim with, but it's all worth persevering with to experience the novel concept. This is a Brazil-only tech toy port from the Game Gear, and is the third and final game in the popular Illusion series of platformers that was released for the Master System. Unfortunately, the game kind of fails to live up to the high pedigree of the series. It just feels a little bit more simplistic and less polished than the games which came before, and it's a bit on the short and easy side too, truth be told. But it's certainly not a bad game. There's some nice level layouts and puzzles, some well-made environments to explore, and reasonable boss fights too. And it still retains that trademark Illusion series charm. I have to admit I've always been a bit dismissive of these old school shooters since moving on from the Atari 2600 to the NES way back in the 1980s, but playing excellent games like Space Invaders Extreme had me re-evaluating their stance and checking out some of the earlier games in the series. Super Space Invaders was one of the big footnotes that led Space Invaders from the original title to the excellent Extreme. The game not only mixes up the behaviour of the alien invaders, it also adds a bunch of elements that were becoming a mainstay of shooters of the time, such as power-ups and exciting boss fights. It's not a perfect port, but it's still lots of fun and leaves the Space Invaders games on the SNES and Mega Drive in its dust. Ever found yourself relating more to the classic monsters of 1930s movies over their human victims? Do you revel in wanton destruction and chaos? Well maybe Rampage is the game for you. The game has two players aiming to level a bunch of cities whilst eating or killing those annoying humans trying to ruin their fun. This Master System port is very well done and retains a lot more than the other home versions of the time, but personally I've never been that enamoured with the game. Still, it's not a bad title, especially when you have a friend along to compete with, which is how I would recommend playing it. After making the highly successful Akari Warriors, SNK tried their hand a few more times at the top-down shooters genre, and this one, which was one of their more notable arcade efforts from the time, ended up being ported quite well to the Master System. Time Soldiers has you playing solo or co-op through different time periods, shooting at the enemies and searching for your captured comrades. There's not a hell of a lot of original ideas here, truth be told, but the action is fast, the gameplay polished, and the boss fights are some of the more impressive for the genre during this era. This is another card game, and it's also actually a pretty good one. It's a breakout style game similar to Arkanoid, where the aim is to bounce the ball back and forth, destroying the blocks in a wall, and picking up power-ups along the way. The game originally used the Master System's paddle controller and unfortunately was only released in Japan and is a pain to get working anywhere else. Though apparently some places like South Korea did get a version that supported the joypad. The game is certainly best on SMS with the paddle controller, but frankly most may be better off just sticking to the Game Gear port which was released worldwide. So what we have here is a very high quality port of the very unique Atari arcade classic, Paperboy. The aim here is simply to dodge obstacles and deliver papers to every house by hitting their mailbox or doorstep. If you miss a house, the owner will stop their subscription the next day. It's a novel concept that requires a lot of skill and accuracy to progress in, and the Master System version is possibly the best of the earlier ports of the game. Dragon Crystal is part of a subgenre of RPGs called roguelikes, which are actually fairly rare on consoles. These games include randomly generated dungeons and item placements, and the goal is to try to last as long as possible with what you've been given. Items are unknown until you use them, at which point every time you come into contact with a similar item from then on it's immediately identifiable. This setup lends itself well to quick sessions, and gives the game some replayability due to their ever-changing and random nature. Dragon Crystal doesn't really stray too far from the genre tropes, but is a nice example of its type. Probably the oldest shim up to make the list. Astro Warrior is a fun and frenetic shooter that plays very similarly to the vertical scrolling levels later found in Salamander. In essence, you collect power ups that give you speed increases, laser weapons, and options. Don't let the crude graphics dissuade you from checking it out, as it's a pretty good game for its age. In fact, I actually prefer it to a lot of its major competition from the time, such as the Star Force games, for example. This is a fun gangster themed light gun game set during the 1920s that has a decent amount of variety in the levels. The game has a lot of charm, with the gangsters floating off as ghosts after being shot, and it even includes a two player option if you have a second light phaser, which was fairly rare during the 8 bit era. Another reasonable addition to the Master System's light gun collection. Miracle Warriors was one of, if not the earliest, JRPGs to reach the West. Like many of these really old 8-bit JRPGs, the game hasn't really aged that well, truth be told. As can be expected, there's a lot of grinding and there's not really a whole lot of plot either, but it's a very good example from its time for anyone who's interested in the progression of the genre, 
and the graphics and general presentation are both excellent for the time too. Make sure to pick up a version with a map, or at least try to print one off as well, as without it it's even more difficult to make headway. The classic Atari arcade game where you have to roll a ball around navigating hazards in order to get it to a goal is well translated to the Master System here, with some impressive 8-bit graphics. The lack of rollerball support like the arcade original is definitely a detriment, but it still remains a fun game. Many people out there, especially in Europe where the game was actually a major hit, still have fond memories of the New Zealand story, and it's not hard to see why. The colourful graphics and cutesy characters running around the maze-like stages, hijacking each other's floating platforms, all of this really made it stand out as a memorable platformer for its era. In fact, I myself have fond memories of playing the arcade version during my childhood, and the game would have placed higher on the list, if not for the sad fact that this version is actually really difficult. It only gives you one credit to do the entire game with. There's also a few inaccuracies here and there, such as the whale boss which no longer eats you. Still, problems aside, the classic gameplay is still there, and it looks great. Sega's excellent early hit motorbike racing game translated to the Master System pretty well, and along with Ghost House was one of the few good games that was released on the card format, making it an excellent budget choice. Like many of Sega's other racing games from the period, Hang On is based around hitting checkpoints against the time limit. The game is fast and furious, responsive, and can often even be quite a tense experience at times when you see that clock ticking down to single digits, as you can just see the next checkpoint coming up in the distance. This was another excellent sports title released by Sega shortly before Walter Payton. It was possibly the first instance of Sega using licensed celebrities to sell their sports games, a tactic they would go on to use with great effect in many Mega Drive games. The game is polished and fun to play and the graphics are well done too, though there's some odd quirks in the way the fields are randomly coloured. A nice sports game for the time. Bomber Raid is a pretty good vertical shmup that plays kind of like the Alesta series, with falling power-ups upgrading your main gun, but mixed with elements from the 1942 series, such as support planes. The graphics are good, the attack waves are respectable, and there's some cool boss battles along the way too, but it's the power-up system which is the most notable. Honestly, it must have one of the longest and most drawn-out power-up systems out there, with your main forward gun powering up and changing incrementally for what feels like forever. Every time you think it must be nearing full power, it'll change and improve yet again. More interestingly though, you can choose different tactics for your support ships and change the direction of their fire on the fly by pressing both buttons simultaneously, which allows you to adapt to each situation as it happens. I'd say it's a fairly underrated game, all in all. This is a very good version of the tense multi-platform game based on the movie that looks and plays excellently. It involves you running around searching for and rescuing survivors while shooting at aliens and making it to the exit before the time runs out. Graphically the game looks great, and there's even some parallax scrolling in there, and the music here is done by celebrated soundsmith Matt Furness, and is some of the most impressive for the system. So I'm actually quite a fan of Game Ground on the Mega Drive. That game was a unique mixture of strategy and simple top-down shooter style action elements that had you adding piles of different playable characters to your roster as you progressed through it and rescued them from the levels. When you did well it was cool to amass an army of ruthless mercenaries, and it really hurt when one of your favourite characters was lost in battle for good. So when I heard there was a Master System version of the game, with a bunch of its own exclusive levels and character quirks, I was very interested to find out about it. The result is somewhat mixed, but still pretty good. It definitely feels a little bit downgraded, mainly it's just a bit slow, and whilst the game does have a lot of new characters in it, the way they work is kind of odd. One player gets the male characters, and the other player gets female versions of those male characters, so you are unfortunately also losing some variety in the game, though I'll admit I do love seeing some of the new character designs. All in all it's still fun though, I mean who doesn't want to collect and amass an army of warriors from different time periods? A nice accompaniment to its older 16-bit brother. Though not really the contra equivalent that the Master System needs, Robocop vs Terminator is still a polished run and gun game alternative that has great graphics, some pretty impressive music, and a level of gore that would never have been seen on Ninty's 8-bit console. Well, maybe apart from that one time Hitler's head exploded, but that was an outlier. Whilst having the same title as the Mega Drive game, this is also another case of same name but different game, with this version being exclusive to the Master System and Game Gear. For the last of the Alex Kid games made for the Master System, Sega decided to do a crossover with its popular Shinobi license. This had come about due to them starting work on an unrelated Shinobi spoof called Shinobi Kid, but at some stage someone at the company decided it would be better to use the already known Alex Kid character in the game instead. 
Regardless of the origins, thankfully after the years of disappointments what we have here is somewhat of a return to form for the character. For obvious reasons it has little in common with the original game, being more similar to Shinobi, but there are some similarities, such as block breaking and swimming stages, which indicate there may have been some limited retrofitting going on. It's a fun game, the only real element holding it back is its length. It's only 8 stages long, but the game is still at least marginally challenging, so it should still take a few attempts. After the terrible port of the original Chuck Rock, developer Core pulled out all of the stops for the sequel, providing a great looking game that managed to keep most of the best elements intact. The platforming is fun and the game has some charm too, with some wonderfully nice touches here and there with puzzles involving the different animals that frequent the stages. A lot of the art design has actually been redone for the Master System, and I really like the new look of the stages and some of the redesigned bosses. The game looks a lot more restrained than the Mega Drive version, and surprisingly it's less censored too, retaining the busty cavewoman enemy from the original computer game, and uh, as well as a couple of other points that are absent on Mega Drive. There's also a handful of redesigned level layouts in this version. Admittedly, unfortunately some gameplay features, such as the rideable birds didn't make the cut though. After weighing up the pros and cons of all the football games available on the SMS, I've decided to go with this as my pick, mainly because it was the most relevant soccer release on SMS and the most reflective of the system's library in the context of the time, as opposed to being a game released well after the system's heyday. At one stage the kickoff series was one of the most popular soccer series out there. This one was an improved version of the highly praised kickoff too, unlike the Mega Drive version which was its own thing. Whilst the most notable football game on the system, it's not very accessible and requires a lot of skill and practice to play. Dribbling in this game is virtually an art form. It's a hard game to get into, but a rewarding game to master. This was the predecessor to the Mega Drive game Mystic Defender, but whilst its sequel goes for an action focus, Spellcaster attempts to mix platforming with RPG and adventuring elements. The game generally alternates between a point and click style interface, platforming stages and spellcasting sections. When you've gotten past the slow start, the whole thing actually works quite well. The plot is better than what you'd expect of the time, the platforming sections are challenging and the adventure segments add an element of problem solving to the gameplay. A unique game which is well worth checking out. One of Sega's biggest arcade hits of the period, Space Harrier was one of the true pioneers of the early pseudo 3D shooters that gained a lot of steam in the late 80s and was one of the games that really popularised the rail shooter. The game has you flying into the screen on a set path dispatching waves of enemies through surreal worlds with offbeat themes. It stunned the world at the time with its advanced graphics and exhilarating gameplay. The Master System port admittedly loses quite a bit in translation, but for its time was still a pretty impressive game and a commendable effort. Now I'll admit, back when I made my original Master System list many years ago, I actually thought this was just a re-release of the original Outrun with support for the 3D glasses. But no, this is actually an exclusive Master System release from the classic racing series with new layouts and some new wave and cloud graphical effects, as well as some new music too. It's a nice game, maybe it doesn't have the illusion of speed of the original Outrun on Master System, but as you can guess, though you can turn off the 3D effects in the options, the game is supposed to be played with the 3D glasses, and that's where it shines. It comes as no surprise knowing Sega's illustrious history of the light gun genre that many of the best and most interesting released during the 8-bit generation arrived on the Master System. Whilst most of the light gun games of the 80s were fairly one-dimensional affairs, Sega were trying to make their games a little bit more interesting. Rescue Mission is a good example of this. In the game you're charged with the duty of protecting medics as they travel across a set of rails trying to rescue injured soldiers. You have to make sure no one gets too close to them and clear the rails of mines. A fun take on the genre. What we have here is an excellent early example of the top-down shooter subgenre, a port of an arcade game called Ninja Princess, but now with the protagonist's gender swapped to a more conventional male hero. The game has some crisp, colourful graphics and for the time was actually quite a varied game in comparison to its main contemporaries, games like Commando and Gunsmoke, with it consistently throwing in new elements as the game progresses. The controls are also well thought out for the time, allowing you to retreat fire as well as providing the player with a new ability to fade out with temporary invincibility. A cool little move that adds to the excitement by allowing for a lot of last minute saves. I think this might be my favourite of these early shooters actually. Playing quite similarly to the Commodore 64's Racing Destruction set, as well as the NES game RC pro -Am, Buggy Run has you racing around courses from an isometric view, upgrading your vehicle between races and outfitting it with different weapons too. 
The game plays well, has very nice graphics and even includes a completely different and fun two player mode that's more similar to games like Super Sprint or Super Off-Road, which is a nice addition. So Fantastic Dizzy must stand as being the most ambitious in the Dizzy series, which was a highly popular series of games in Britain uh, and Russia that was often at the top of the multi-format sales charts here during the 1980s. The basic premise to all Dizzy games is just to walk back and forth collecting and using items to help the people you meet in order to solve puzzles, which once complete allow you to progress further into the game. This one was ported from the NES and was the biggest Dizzy game. It's massive and spans many different locales. Whilst I do prefer the later Mega Drive version of the game, this version is not without its advantages and quirks. For one thing it has the more updated item menu, allowing you to choose your items instead of having to cycle through them. And it also has another mini game, a tubing style section with Dizzy travelling down some rapids. This is a cool little puzzle game where you play as a penguin trying to roll its egg to the bottom of the screen without letting it break. If it drops too far, uh, the safe distance is shown by a white line, then it will break. If you land on it and it has nowhere to move, it will also break. And if an enemy reaches it, then again it will break. The game is just one of a series of games popular in Japan which started out on Sega's first console, the SG-1000. With this one they added in new types of blocks and a great new level editor. It's a nice to design game that's quite clever and intuitive to play. The best tennis game on the system and a respectable sequel to the original that succeeded in retaining its best elements. The game plays well and gives you a pretty reasonable number of options with good control and different ground types too. It also retains the excellent stat building tour mode from the original and the graphics have been improved too. The game is made for European machines so it runs a little too fast if played on the US Master System unfortunately. This is a nice port of the puzzling classic where you have the ability to create and remove blocks which you can then use as stepping stones or to create walls to block out enemies with the aim to collect a key and then get to the exit. Unfortunately this Master System version was one of the few games that was only ever released in Japan and playing Japanese imports on the Western Master System is incredibly difficult. In fact from what I understand it's actually easier to play Western games on a Japanese system than vice versa so it's best to keep that in mind if thinking about grabbing a copy of this game. This was an excellent sequel to the classic arcade game Ghosts and Goblins. Everything great about that game had been retained and new additions such as multi-directional firing were a perfect fit for the series and really helped to flesh out the gameplay mechanics and feel of the game and create a more dynamic experience. Now I'm sure many will dismiss this port out of hand, jumping to the conclusion that it's largely irrelevant due to the more powerful console versions out there. But that would be a mistake as this is actually a very unique and interesting port of the game. For this version the developers made numerous changes to make the game easier and more accessible not only do you no longer commit to your jumps like you did in the other versions, but the stages have hidden upgrades throughout them that give you permanent boosts to your hit points, jumping ability, running speed and magic. As such, those who are fans of the Ghosts and Goblins series may really hate this version, whilst those who struggled before may find they actually prefer it. All in all, a notable conversion of a platforming classic. When Sega brought their arcade hit Shinobi to the Master System they decided to overhaul the whole game in order to make it a more accessible experience, replacing the one hit kills with a health bar, removing the requirement to save the hostages and slowing the whole thing down a lot. Unfortunately for me though, I'm actually a big fan of the original source material and really prefer the fast, tense and oftentimes brutal gameplay of that game over the much slower, more deliberate feel of this version. Still, I have to admit it's a reasonable game in its own right, and to be fair to it, it even has a few aces up its sleeve in the form of extras, such as new weapon upgrades and magic. And as I said, it's the most accessible version of the game, so it has its own merits. Deep Duck Trouble is a respectable platformer starring the famous Disney character. It has some really phenomenal presentation, with excellent work on the animation and environments and some of the best graphics on the system overall, including some nicely presented cutscenes. Whilst the art design can't be faulted, the game is admittedly a little on the slow side and is only really about 5 levels long. And unfortunately, surprisingly, playing the game on a US system makes matters even worse, now causing the game to play at a very inconsistent and erratic speed. Still, for those who like their games a bit more sedate, it's a nice little title with a lot of varied gameplay and environment changes and some excellent and memorable chase scenes too. Battle Outrun was an exclusive game in the Outrun series for SMS that has little if anything in common with the other games of the series. What we have here is actually clearly inspired by Taito's classic, Chase HQ, which was massive in Europe at the time. Like that game the goal here is to chase down crooks and run their cars off the road before the time runs out and they escape. 
Thankfully Sega have added some of their own elements to the formula, the primary one being currency gained from doing the levels quickly, and a shop that allows you to buy upgrades for your car to make it faster and better at taking and delivering hits. The game recreates the great gameplay of Chase HQ, builds on it and has fantastic graphics and environments to boot. This Simpsons themed puzzle game is basically like a reverse version of Lemmings. Instead of rescuing the little critters, it entails you leading lots of mice around the stages to a crushing machine. Where the game really differs from Lemmings is in its navigation of the stages. Instead of using a cursor and menus to choose what you want to do, it plays in a much more hands-on way akin to a platform game, so you're doing jumps and placing blocks to lead the mice around. The SMS version of the game is actually very well made and is, in fact, one of the best versions of the game available. Even the graphics somehow managed to stand up to the 16-bit versions. The colour here is vibrant and bright, and for some reason the puzzles are actually more complex too. So the Master System has to have one of the best ratios of good to bad licensed games out there. Honestly, unlike with most systems, most of the licensed games on the SMS are actually pretty good, and Jurassic Park is no exception. What we have here is just a well-designed platform game with a versatile main character, and boss fights that are impressive and well-designed too. The developers have really tried to think of some new and inventive ways to present the usual platformer staples, and there's decent variety in the stages too. The game isn't that long, but has multiple endings, with the true ending requiring you to find all the Jurassic Park logos hidden in the stages, so there's a lot of exploration to do before you see everything it has to offer. An actually surprisingly good title. A port of the successful Australian NES game, Star Wars is a platformer with a non-linear overworld joining the different stages together, many of which are optional. You explore the world doing tricky platforming jumps searching for the other characters and collecting shield upgrades for the Millennium Falcon to use in its space flight levels. At first this SMS port feels like a harder version of the already too difficult NES game, mainly due to its slightly more loose controls, but this is misleading as there's been numerous changes made to the game which actually offset this and make it a much more forgiving and playable experience than its NES parent. Enemies do less damage, health items have been moved, and invincibility time after taking a hit has been lengthened too. Some of this can also be changed back, if so wanted, by changing the new to this version difficulty options too. Apart from the gameplay improvements, Star Wars has also had a complete graphical overhaul for the SMS, and the game looks fantastic, far far better than before. This was a fantastic Batman platformer, which was completely exclusive to the Master System. Even a similar looking Game Gear version has different gameplay mechanics and level layouts. The first thing which is instantly noticeable about the game is its inclusion of a grappling hook to swing across hazards, which probably conjures up thoughts of Bionic Commando in most people's minds, but it's actually implemented very differently here, with Batman Returns being more reminiscent of Sega's methodical, challenging arcade games like eSWAT and Shinobi than Capcom's popular series. Like the two Sega efforts, it's more about careful movements, precision timing, and getting into the right position to deal with the enemy emplacements than it is about dynamic swinging around the stages. The grappling hook here is mainly used to explore the levels, and whilst tricky to use at first, with practice is a very cool mechanic that allows you to pull off some impressive manoeuvres to reach far off areas. The game is a good length, is challenging, and even includes branching pathways to add to the longevity. One of the most enduring classics of 80s light gun games, Taito's Operation Wolf set the benchmark for the genre back in its day in the arcades, and this Master System port was pretty good, often credited as being the best home port of the game from the time. The game has you playing as a lone soldier behind enemy lines trying to free hostages. You fire the light phaser at the screen whilst holding Joypad 2 to its side, which is used to shoot off grenades like a sort of grenade launcher attachment. It's yet another example of why the Master System was the console of choice for fans of the light gun genre. Unfortunately the game was designed for European systems though, and doesn't run properly on a North American Master System. Impossible Mission was one of the genre-defying titles of early action-adventure games, and had a ton of impact when originally released for the C64 in 1984. The game has you exploring a huge non-linear complex, evading robots and searching for parts of a code required to finish the game. It includes many different aspects, requiring both dexterity and problem-solving, and it's a game that really doesn't handhold at all. It was ageing a little by the time of this SMS port, but as said, it was a very important release in the history of gaming, and this version has some really nice updated graphics and even some quality of life improvements here and there too, all of which put it in a running for being probably the best of the original versions of the game out there. Another excellent game based on a Taito arcade machine, which further cements their place as one of the most important Japanese companies on the system. Rainbow Islands is a fairly unique game that is difficult to explain, Basically it's a vertically scrolling platformer, 
where you can create rainbows to both attack enemies and use as platforms. The Master System version is an all around good port, even having some extras thrown in such as between level story scenes, but don't spend too much time trying to achieve the secret ending here, as unfortunately it doesn't seem to work. This was a very classy and playable port of the popular 16-bit Amiga computer game. The gameplay here is surprisingly close to the original game, which was a platformer that was sort of like if Mario and the New Zealand story had had a love child. The game is very fast and responsive, and impressively even some of the graphical effects, such as the original snow and parallax, have been retained. If anything, this version of the game actually makes the 16-bit console ports look a little bit lazy and rushed by comparison, as they're only marginally better looking than this version. Heck, the Super Nintendo version somehow manages to even slow down more to boot. After a long wait, gamers finally got a fairly close home version of the popular arcade game Gauntlet with this excellent Master System release. Arguably the best home conversion of Gauntlet for the time, until the later Mega Drive port that was included as an extra in Gauntlet 4. The game is a sort of top-down shooter set in maze-like dungeons filled to the brim with hordes of enemies. There's multiple exits to each stage to find, some interesting puzzle elements thrown in later, and a fantastic two-player co-op feature, which, honestly, is kind of required if you want to get the full experience. No four-player co-op though, unfortunately, as can be expected, really. This is an excellent and underappreciated cute em up which breaks from the norm of the subgenre by allowing you to fly in any direction freely in a manner more akin to shoot em up classics like Defender. The aim is to destroy each level's spawn bases before coming up against and dispatching that world's boss. Money can be collected and used to buy upgrades in the shops. The game is quite unique and the bosses are excellent and are some of the most impressive seen in the home at the time, and it would have placed higher if not for the brilliant sequel improving and building on the formula. One of the more popular of the Tetris wannabes of the time, Columns requires you to match coloured blocks of three in a row. The game was really pushed as Sega's answer to the aforementioned block falling puzzler, which was achieving huge success at the time, but never quite lived up to the hype. Still, it's a fun enough puzzler which includes a much more combo oriented focus than Tetris, and manages to be a respectable rival to the classic game, prior to the rise of more serious competitors like Poyo Poyo. So Master of Darkness is a shameless clone of the Castlevania series, pure and simple. Now that I've got an A out of the way, let's get to talking about the actual game. So everything that makes Castlevania great is here, the level designs, atmosphere and boss battles. And on top of all that there's some new elements too, including a more in-depth weapon system and some well presented Ninja Gaiden style story sections too. The atmosphere centred around Victorian London is also great and feels equally good though very different to the gothic themes found in the Castlevania games. If I were to forget that it's a belated clone and just do a straight comparison of the games without context, I'd rate this higher than the original Castlevania as it's fairer and has a better difficulty curve, but obviously a lot of that really has to do with the age of that first Castlevania game. Zillion was an action-adventure game released shortly after Metroid, and as such was pretty much immediately mislabeled a Metroid clone. But what we actually have here is a game primarily inspired by the earlier, previously mentioned Impossible Mission, that only takes a few aspects from Metroid. Zillion has you exploring a huge complex in an effort to rescue your captured friends, and as you search through the screens you discover codes required to open the doors and power-ups to increase the abilities of your character. As each comrade is rescued, you also gain the ability to swap to them, with each having different attributes, allowing them access to different areas. Zillion is a very unique and original early Metroidvania from a time when they were just finding their feet. It's strangely reliant on memory as a main gameplay mechanic, which can be quite difficult to juggle at times, but thankfully the game does also have some much needed quality of life additions, it includes an in-game map and health regen pods for example, which would not be seen until later Metroid games. Arriving shortly after Super Mario Bros., the original Wonder Boy was another of the true innovators of early scrolling platformers, and the character would go on to become a mainstay on the Master System, with his series of games being one of the best associated with the console. This first game in the series was fast and furious in comparison to everything else that was out there at the time, and some of its elements, like the exhilarating skateboard power-up that sends you flying through the levels, uh, with practice, were really unique and rewarding too. The SMS version is as close to being arcade perfect as you can get, and actually even has a bunch of new and exclusive levels, which arguably even put it a little ahead of the arcade version. There was also a better known NES port of Wonderboy out there too, which was renamed Adventure Island due to licensing reasons, but to be honest it was not a patch on this. 
This is a popular block stacking puzzler which was originally planned by Atari to be a follow up to Tetris. At the time Atari thought they owned Tetris but it turned out the company that they got the rights from only had the rights to the computer releases of the game and were defining all consoles as being computers, just dedicated to video gaming. Which is essentially true but wasn't in the spirit of the original agreement they had. Anyway, the right situation in regards to Tetris was a mess and Atari created this to be a sequel. The game has you holding or dropping stacks of blocks of similar colours and as the game progresses you get different objectives to meet. It's a nice puzzler that has appeared on many different systems over the years and this Master System version is very good. Kensaden is a very classy platform game with mild action adventure aspects that really grows on you over time and is actually deeper and more rewarding to learn than it first seems. The game has tons of atmosphere with moody music and a very Japanese style to its horror themes and the gameplay actually gives you quite a lot of freedom as you can choose which stages you want to tackle and in what order. And given that victory against the bosses of these stages gain your character a selection of new moves and health upgrades, some strategy comes into play in prioritising what upgrades you want to gain for your character before attempting to take on the final boss. All in all, when given the chance Kensaden becomes a very compulsive gameplay experience. Prince of Persia is an action adventure game which rose to prominence on computers, largely for its high quality animation for the time and smooth character movement and large move set. The game has a strong emphasis on exploration, with a healthy dose of platform jumping and climbing as you make your way through the dungeons, and it had a lot of influence on many other games over the years too, from 16-bit titles like Flashback, all the way to 3D games like Tomb Raider many years later. This Master System port had good graphics and sound for the time prior to the release of the 16-bit versions, but did have some inaccuracies, though nowhere near to the level of the NES version. It's also designed for European Master Systems, and unfortunately gets buggy at 60Hz. So Battle Maniacs was a Brazilian exclusive Battletoads game ported from the original Super Nintendo title. It had been made in Britain, sent off and even reviewed by UK magazines, but for some reason never actually released. Thankfully Tech Toy came to the rescue and managed to give it an official release in Brazil. And we're lucky they did, as the game must stand as one of the most impressive beat-em-ups on the system, with some of the greatest music and graphics of any SMS game released. It even included an all-important two-player mode, a feature that was sadly missing from most SMS beat-em-ups. The game plays superbly, frankly I find it more fun than the Super Nintendo original, and it would have placed much higher if not for the unfortunate fact that it wasn't quite finished. The main issue being a few levels with no music, only sound effects, but there's also some missing graphics in one bit and some temperamental areas here and there. One thing to mention is that whilst this game was released in Brazil, it was actually designed for European consoles. You can tell this by comparing the music to the SNES game. The majority of YouTubers playing the game actually have their emulators set up incorrectly, which causes the game to run too fast. This is an excellent, fast and colourful SMS exclusive fighting game that is kind of reminiscent of the Street Fighter series. Masters of Combat is an all around great example of the genre, and whilst it takes a lot of elements from Street Fighter 2, it still manages to have a feel of its own due to some of its more unique features, such as a high emphasis on dash and evasion moves. The game admittedly could have stood to have a few more characters, but it definitely still stands up as one of the best original fighters released for any 8-bit console. Unfortunately it's an extremely rare game these days. Here we have a platformer with stacks of charm. For those who don't know it's the precursor to the Mega Drive game Decap Attack, or rather the game which became Decap Attack to be precise, and could be considered the spiritual sequel to Kid Cool on the NES. The artwork style is fantastic, the bosses never fail to be interesting and imaginative, and the gameplay feels quite unique too. The unique feel is mainly due to the inertia based controls, the faster you run the further you jump, and your ability to swap between four characters with different attributes. The controls can be tricky to get used to, so if you have little patience for tricky games then this is probably not for you, but anyone who wants something challenging and full of charm should definitely check it out. East was an influential JRPG that started out on computers which spawned many successful sequels across many different formats, and the game was ported very well here to the Master System with some excellent redesigned graphics. Just check out those beautiful character portraits. Gameplay wise East somewhat has the usual RPG structure. It contains a large overworld to see and many villages to explore and dungeons to fight through, but it also uses a unique battle system whereby you simply run into the enemies off center and the outcome is automatically decided based on your stats which takes a while to get used to. The game is an important release but it's also a fairly old JRPG so I expect a lot of grinding. This is another Disney licensed game handled by Sega. As can be expected from the company, the graphics, sound and gameplay shine through in much the same way as they did with all of the other ones they produced. 
Lucky Dime Caper is actually probably among the most challenging of these games that they put out. There's no real puzzle elements like those found in the Illusion games, nor adventuring aspects like those of Quackshot either. It's just you, the enemies and a multitude of treacherous jumps and elaborate hazards to keep you constantly on your toes. Anyone who finds themselves thinking that the Mickey games are too easy and wants to sink their teeth into a game with more challenge need look no further than the Lucky Dime Caper. Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine is a port of the Japanese game known as Poyo Poyo on other machines. It was quite possibly the greatest from the glut of Tetris variants that appeared after that game's meteoric rise. The gameplay simply has you stacking beans by colour to make them disappear, but has an elegant combo based design which is both fun and rewarding to master. This version is a little on the minimalist side graphically, but the gameplay is still very much intact and there's a few interesting additions unique to it for the time as well, such as the objective based mission mode which have been taken from the Game Gear title. This is the first game in what would become the highly respected Alester series of shoot 'em ups, and a pseudo sequel to Zanuck as well. The Alester series would become one of the most important series of vertical scrolling shooters in the history of the genre, with releases like Musha Alester on the Mega Drive and Space Megaforce on the Super Nintendo. Many of the staples of the series were already evident right from the beginning falling power ups for improving your primary guns, a varied choice for secondary weapons, and a metric ton of frenetic action packed gameplay. This version has fewer levels than the MSX computer version, but runs better, especially in the PAL version where it's actually generally faster for once, which has to go down as a first. So plainly put, Golden Axe Warrior is a totally shameless Zelda clone for the Master System, but it's a very well made one that carefully recreates pretty much all of the famous NES game's main gameplay elements. There's no radical additions to the formula here, but there are a number of fairly notable improvements. The overworld is much larger for instance, nearly twice the size. There's more variation in the terrain, marginal graphical improvements and the world is a little more fleshed out too, with distinct landmarks such as villages and people who have more to say than a sentence of broken dialogue, including some appearances from stalwart Golden Axe protagonists. It's obviously very lacking when it comes to originality and it was a little bit late in coming too, but when the source material was as good as it was it's hard not to be grateful for the opportunity to play through any nice variation on the theme. I've used the Japanese title for the game here, as it helps to differentiate it from the other versions. Taito really went to town when it came to creating this particular port of their single screen bubble blowing platformer, intending not to merely do a port, but provide a full upgrade to their popular arcade game. This version has a bunch of new and exclusive levels, a password system, some new objectives and even includes two original exclusive boss fights. The ported portion itself is also extremely accurate, containing many of the important little details that most of the other ports of the time missed. Generally Taito simply excelled themselves in all respects here, and you can tell they took this port very seriously. This was a very admirable port of possibly the greatest western made RPG of the period. The graphics and artwork have been overhauled over the original computer versions, and the interface is much simpler and more intuitive to use than before, thankfully without losing too many features either, unlike the NES version which went a bit too far. It's a very genuine and idealistic game, and is a pretty good example of the differences between the early western and Japanese RPGs of the time, with its much less linear style and greater freedom of choice than in the sorts of RPGs found on the NES. This was a respectable port of the arcade classic, which turned out very competitive for its time. Master System Outrun is a fast and fairly smooth racing experience, with lots of colour, a variety of different landscapes, and a good illusion of speed too. One of the most notable elements of the game is its branching paths. Every so often there will be a fork in the road which allows you to choose your route, leading to different environments and courses. These elements, coupled with the uninterrupted transitions between sections, add a real adventure on the open road feeling to the game. Much later versions like the one on Turbo Graphics would admittedly blow this one away, but at the time during the game's heyday this was the leader of the pack. The sequel to the classic platformer, Wonder Boy, marked a big and important departure for the series, with a change of setting to medieval times and the incorporation of many new adventuring elements. You now had equipment, currency and health upgrades to worry about, and as such the whole thing entered a new level of depth which would be built on as the series progressed. The money is hidden all around the levels, requiring you to search every nook and cranny, and the health upgrades are tied to how fast and well you complete the stages. All of this makes the game highly rewarding to learn and master. Wonder Boy Monsterland was ported to many different formats with varying degrees of success over the years, but the SMS version is probably the best. It's also the only one to remove the big ugly status bar that took up a quarter of the screen to the left that was seen in the arcade original. 
California Games is a sports game where you take turns playing through a variety of different events, such as surfing, skateboarding or rollerblading. It's from a series of sports games that became a phenomenon on the C64 back in the day, mainly due to their variety and uniqueness and fun multiplayer modes. This one in particular became a bit of an enduring classic for the sports genre back when it was released on the Commodore 64 in 1987. The SMS version was easily the best of the console ports of the game, and arguably the best version in general. The Mega Drive version had better graphics, but didn't arrive until two years later, played differently to the other versions, and was actually missing one of the events. The second new Sonic game created specially for the Master System heralded a change in development team and a new take on how to best miniaturise Sonic's 16-bit gameplay. Whilst the original game took pains to adapt and change the series for the weaker hardware, Sonic 2 goes for a speedier style closer to the spirit of the originals, whilst also attempting to add some of its own unique elements to the series, such as hand gliders and multiple endings. It also introduced the world to Tails, as this actually predated his Mega Drive introduction by a few weeks. Overall the game is definitely a success, but can be a little bit unintuitive and confusing at times, and definitely lacks some of the accessibility of the other games from the series. The game was optimised for European machines, but does work decently when played on a US console. Mainly there's just a glitch with the scrolling on a few levels, but it's really not that noticeable. There's also a Game Gear port, but that version is best avoided as it doesn't really work very well with the handheld's confined screen. Populous was a seminal god sim where you're in charge of raising and nurturing your own people with the ultimate aim of defeating your rivals. You do this basically by terraforming the land to facilitate the growth of settlements, while using your magic to mess with your opponent's settlements. It's compulsive stuff, and the Master System version, whilst devoid of a lot of the in-game sound, plays pretty quickly as a result and works quite well for an 8-bit console. Developers Probe did an impressive job of squeezing the most out of the Master System with this unbelievable port of Road Rash. I don't think any other 8-bit racer comes close to matching its undulating terrain and smooth panning on the horizon and clouds. It's so good there's trade-offs with the 16-bit Mega Drive version. Road Rash is a racer with a decidedly violent bent. On top of the well-implemented racing and shop elements, the game allows you to punch and kick the other riders off their bikes, and fight with cops too, which, whilst maybe not the most moral of gameplay elements, was nonetheless an exciting and dynamic addition. It starts off a little slow, but as you earn money and buy new, faster bikes, it opens up into the fast and exhilarating game we all know and love. Yet again, Sega managed to use a beloved license to create another classic, polished platformer, Asterix is a fun, lengthy and very well designed game from start to finish. On top of the more traditional elements you'd expect from games of the genre, there's also some minor brain work required in the form of different potion effects, which help to keep you thinking throughout. It conveys the style of the popular French comic books really well, and definitely shouldn't be missed by platformer fans. Brilliant sequel to the addictive, fast-paced and underappreciated cutesy Blastophon original. The main game hasn't changed that much apart from getting another coat of polish in the gameplay and graphics departments, but there is one notable addition, a change to the stage structure. Unlike in the original game, Fantasy Zone 2's levels are built up from multiple interconnecting worlds joined by warp points. You can freely explore and travel between stages, and you are required to completely clear out every spawn point in each of these areas before moving on to the boss fight and the next set of stages. Generally it's just a classic gameplay in a new deluxe form, but the new structure gives the game a very mild exploration and adventure feel too. I spent a good amount of time thinking about whether to go with this or Golden Axe Warrior as the definitive top-down action-adventure game for the Master System. Eventually with great difficulty I decided that whilst Golden Axe was the longer and more involving game, it just doesn't have the charm or personality of Golvelius. It lacks a little in identity by comparison, and was also too late to be a decisive release in the console's library. Golvelius was clearly inspired by Zelda, but unlike Golden Axe Warrior, it is in no way a clone. It deviates from Zelda in many areas, being much more focused on action and less on puzzle solving, and containing multiple types of gameplay sections that incorporate different views. It also has a very different style, with some very nicely realised cutscenes and stills, and there's offbeat humour too. That old lady really needs to work on her sales pitch. All elements which help to make the game likeable and memorable. Definitely one of the all-time best Japanese action-adventure games of the late 80s. In case anyone doesn't know, this game is actually not a port of the popular Mega Drive platformer. It's a completely original and arguably better game that was created for the Master System that has totally different level layouts to the original and is much more puzzle-orientated in its gameplay. I'd say it's actually influenced more by Capcom's popular DuckTales game than it is its Mega Drive counterpart, 
using that game's non-linear level ordering and hidden health power-ups. Overall the game is a lot of fun, it's well designed, very polished and the upgrades lend a slight adventuring and exploration aspect to it too. Racing around everyday locales in tiny cars in top-down perspective may not sound like an idea for an all-time gaming classic, but when you have Codemasters at the helm of a racing game, assume nothing. Codemasters really saw the potential in the license here and ran with it, incorporating idea after idea and creating a selection of some of the most memorable courses in the genre. The game is great fun in single player, but where it really comes into its own is the fun and intensely competitive multiplayer aspect. Definitely a game to put on and play when friends are visiting. Yet another very admirable port to the Master System, Lemmings is a puzzle classic where you have to guide a whole load of the eponymous creatures to an exit without too many of them dying. The Master System version has slightly lower requirements than the original games, so it's a little bit more suited to beginners, but there's a few levels here that are actually exclusive to this and the Game Gear version, and also for some reason. This version looks fantastic. The colour choices here really pop and everything looks detailed, bright and colourful. A very nice little version of the game all in all. Power Strike 2 is an excellent shoot 'em up from genre favourites Compile, known for their Alesta series. It's probably the most sought after of the rare Master System games out there, due to the pedigree of its developer amongst the shoot 'em up community, as well as its complete exclusivity to the Master System. The uh, Game Gear's Power Strike 2 is actually a completely different game that just shares a name with this. All of the hallmarks of Compile's other shooters are very much evident here. The plethora of weapons, the speed, the intense action, the clever attack waves, the excellent music, and it's all tied together with some really impressive and colourful graphics and tons of polish. Truly one of Compile's forgotten classics. The Ninja Gaiden series was one of the best action series on the NES, and the SMS game, which is a completely original exclusive produced by Sega themselves, does the series justice admirably. The graphics are fantastic, and the sense of speed as you make your way through the stages wall jumping and climbing is unparalleled during the 8-bit era. The gameplay is admittedly as brutal as it ever was, but everything just flows very well here. The game takes much from Sunsoft's excellent Batman NES game as well, and these elements mix very well with the classic Ninja Gaiden gameplay and presentation. Sega's take on the classic series is a very different but equally good breed of Ninja Gaiden, with a feel of its own reminiscent of some of the later Shinobi games. After the huge popularity of the original Super Mario Bros. pushed NES sales into the stratosphere, Kodaro Hayashida, who would later go on to work on the Fantasy Star series, was charged with creating Sega's response. And what a phenomenal job he did too. Miracle World was an ambitious title for its time, arriving after Super Mario Bros. 1 but before the game we know in the West as Super Mario Bros. 2, and it included huge numbers of additions. Unlike earlier platformers like Super Mario Bros. and Wonder Boy, which essentially cycled through four environments and repeated the same boss fights over and over, Alex could provide a journey through many different environments and had you facing a multitude of different bosses on your quest. There was usable currency in shops, item management and a plethora of different vehicles and items to buy and use too. All of these elements helped add scope to the game and it felt much more like a journey than previous scrolling platformers had so far. There was also a lot more strategy too, as choosing to buy and use the correct items for each level could make the world of difference to your survival chances. If Miracle World has one downfall, it's in the game's inaccessibility. Unlike Mario's games, it requires a lot of patience and practice to enjoy, and the weird matches of rock, paper, scissors that take place throughout the game require some memorisation too. But like many of Sega's games, taking the time to master the game leads to one of the most rewarding experiences of the 8-bit era. Here's one of the all-time classic shooters of the 1980s, a game full to the brim with great new ideas, ranging from the iconic force pod that can be fired off and deftly manipulated by the player, to the unique bosses, all designed to be taken down with clever force pod strategies. There was the iconic art design inspired by H.R. Geiger, and some classic music too. Securing R-Type for their console was a real victory for Sega, and getting Shoot 'em up legends compiled to port the game was also a wise choice, as they did a great job with the translation. Outside of a bit of flicker, this was an excellent port of R-Type, and Compile even added an exclusive new level to the game that's in no other version. Arguably the best home port for the time, as while the more impressive PC Engine version was much more polished, it was initially split into two halves, with the consumer having to buy the last four levels separately until the later US Turbo Graphics release. I hate to place a Sonic game higher than Alex Kid on Alex's home turf, but this game's higher accessibility and pick up and play value just about caused it to edge Miracle World out. This was the first of the Sonic games specially designed for the Master System, and is, I feel, also the best. 
The game does lose a lot of the speed and freedom of the 16-bit originals, but this is replaced with more emphasis on the platform jumping fundamentals, and when taking into account the weaker 8-bit hardware, this change to the gameplay creates a well-judged, fairer game free from too much slowdown or other unwanted frustrations. It's a polished, fun platforming outing that did the character justice and gave Master System Sonic fans their own title to be proud of. After their brilliant Mickey Mouse game, Castle of Illusion, Sega managed to come back with something even better for the sequel. Land of Illusion builds and improves on pretty much all aspects of the earlier Master System classic, with graphics, music, longevity and especially gameplay all having commendable levels of effort lavished upon them. It's the new adventure style abilities which really set the game apart from many other platformers of the time though. Instead of just gaining health upgrades, Mickey now also gains abilities such as climbing and shrinking as the game progresses, opening up new areas in some of the earlier stages to explore and giving the game slightly more of a Metroidvania feel. Overall Land of Illusion is simply a great example of 8-bit platforming. One of the greatest games of the 8-bit generation, Dragon's Trap was just a perfectly realised action-adventure game full to the brim with charm and personality. The game is a Metroidvania title, where each new area is accessible not through the acquisition of new weapons and equipment, but through the transformation of the player into a sequence of memorably designed monsters caused by a curse he has fallen under. A bit of a masterstroke of design, truth be told. The graphics here are great, providing the player with sumptuous environments to explore full of memorably oddball characters and foes to defeat creating one of the most memorable worlds of the 8-bit era. And the gameplay is always well judged, with carefully designed platforming layouts throughout. And due to the aforementioned monster changes, it also never becomes stale or formulaic either, as you always want to see what new monster and ability you're about to come across. Just a phenomenal and unique game all in all, and a joy to play through. My pick for number one has to go to Fantasy Star. As far as I'm concerned, this is surely the best JRPG of the entire 8-bit generation, and one of the first truly defining titles of the entire genre. Fantasy Star was really ahead of its time when it was released back in 1987. Everything from the graphics to the fairly detailed plotting and first-person dungeon sections were extremely impressive, and its whole world, characters and storyline just succeeded at being much more fully formed and fleshed out than any of its main competitors of the time most of which were still filled with drab, repetitive and uninteresting environments, and characters who, quite frankly, could barely string a coherent sentence together. Here on the other hand, we even have little cutscenes with the characters that show the world and move the plot forwards, a mainstay of what people would later come to associate as a defining trait of the JRPG subgenre. Apart from some minor grinding here and there, and the later dungeons probably requiring manual mapping if you don't want to get lost, the game was also dated surprisingly well, and is still quite playable for such an old RPG even now. Well that's the end of the video, if you enjoyed it then please like and subscribe and maybe consider supporting us on Patreon, the link is in the description. See ya!